Uh, I'm uh, Dorian Cave, uh, so I'm uh, the curator of the Professions Network on the Deep Adaptation Forum, uh, and I'm joined today uh, by Matthew Slater. Um, so Matthew has been working on, uh, on alternatives to money since uh, 2003, I think. Uh, so Matthew, you've been, um, you've been writing uh, open source software. You, uh, you're the founder, one of the founders of uh, Community Forge. And uh, you also co-created the Money and Society uh, MOOC, so this uh, online course with, uh, with Jen Van Bell. So, um, uh, yeah, thanks for, for accepting to, uh, to take part in, in this event. Uh, I'll say you're also uh, one of um, another member of uh, the core team of the Deep Adaptation Forum. So you're also a co-creator of this, this forum. Um, so um, today we're here to, uh, to talk about money and uh, how money is related uh, to deep adaptation uh, and society in, in general. So um, I thought we might start off uh, just going over a little context of uh, about what, what is wrong with money currently and, uh, and the, the economic system. So we'll, we'll try to uh, not to spend too long on this because there's, uh, there's a lot to say. Uh, but um, yeah, I thought that uh, I could uh, just uh, state a few key points, which to me uh, um, stand out as uh, some of the uh, the main um, causes for which money should be uh, transformed if we want to improve the way society works. Um, so um, uh, you could say that the world economy is controlled by this. Uh, global banking cartel, right? Uh, sort of a, a cartel that has government mandated monopolies on the issue of currency, um, which uh, creates money uh, uh, by giving out loans to people. Uh, a cartel that charges so much interest on loans uh, of, uh, of money that they never had, that there isn't even enough money in the world to pay it all back. So which uh, creates this, uh, this necessity for the economy to keep on constantly growing, right? For some of this interest to be payable at all, which is of course uh, one of the root causes of uh, ecological damage that puts human survival at risk. And that's, um, that's just for bankers' profits, right? Uh, with, um, what, what other sort of main uh, issues would you uh, like to uh, to remind us of uh, as regards the, this whole monetary system, Matthew? Well, uh, from some of the reading I've been doing in the last couple of years, uh, it seems to me that uh, one of the problems of the growth of the money system is not only the fact that money is interest uh, issued as interest-bearing debt, but that uh, after the money is issued, it circulates around a bit and then it lands in a tax haven and then it gets stuck uh, and it's impossible for me to tell how important that dynamic is compared to the interest bearing debt dynamic um, but it's important to recognize that money if it's going to serve us as a medium of exchange must be available to exchange and if it constantly gets piled up in tax havens it's not available to do that and right. this has been made worse by the quantitative easing of course because a lot of the quantitative easing money has gone almost straight into the tax havens uh, as it's been uh, distributed first and foremost to those who already have the most money. Mm. So it's, um, what you're saying is that it's uh, this function of money as a store of value, uh, mm, which is um, sort of um, uh, incentivizing its accumulation. And that is a, that is a huge issue, especially when it can only, well, when it tends to flow towards those who already have the most, uh, the most of it, right? And that this has been emphasized in the wake of the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 with the quantitative uh, easing, right? So, yeah, it's, so uh, if you look at the dictionary definition of money, it will say that uh, money is supposed to be a store of value and a medium of exchange. 
Yeah. But I'm I'm struggling to find out where that idea came from. That's not anybody's ideal. That's a description of what it is. And when you break it down, those two functions are very different. Um, and they represent different class interests as far as I can see. So what rich people want money for is to store value, preferably at high interest rates. And what most people want money for is as a medium of exchange and they don't care about the interest rates. Mm. So what most people need money for is uh, simply to, um, in order to acquire daily necessities and uh, in order to uh, pay their bills and, uh, and so on. Well, uh, rich people, in fact, um, see money uh, or at least use money uh, in a way that just enables them to become increasingly powerful, right? So the, the monetary system, in effect, is a, is a source of, of growing inequality, isn't it? Yeah, by definition, um, mm. money has a way of um, calling money unto itself. Well, there's a saying I remember from Yugoslavia, that the devil shits on the biggest pile. <laughs> uh, mm. and that seems to describe the behavior of money perfectly. Yes, absolutely. I read somewhere that something like 2% of the world population uh, own 50% of global wealth. There's also, there was also a statistic from Oxfam, I think in, in 2017, that eight men owned uh, as much as 50% of mankind also. Yeah, they right. update that figure every year and it seems mm. to get like one less person every year. And so we can see that the global wealth is becoming more and more centralized. Mm. Would you also say that uh, because of the way this system is structured, um, the currency that people use uh, in their everyday lives is in fact be, um, being debased uh, as this banking cartel back the government deficit spending with this... Um, with this debt money and this and this creates inflation therefore increasing prices for ordinary people would you say that this is another kind of inequality which is brought about by this monetary system no i'm not worried about inflation in the way that it causes money to lose value inflation actually works against the people who are holding a lot of money mm. and it works in favor of people who owe a lot of money so in a sense, inflation favors the majority. And that's one reason the government uh, likes to keep uh, uh, inflation above zero because the government is a net borrower. So it's inflating uh, its own debts away. But of course, there are, there are people who think that money should be sound. Uh, yeah. They talk about gold currencies and things. And you can see these charts about how the US dollar has inflated its value away down to 4% of what it used to be right. in its heyday. Um, but for me, that's fine. That's a, a, a social decision. And if you mm. agree with the government, then you agree with the government's right to do that to the money in the interest of the wider economy. And if you want to store your value, use something that isn't money and take such the as, risk. Such as, such um, as gold, such gold. as grain, such mm. as uh, even futures contracts or something like that. Um, any store of value is going to be a bit speculative because you don't know what the future holds. But mm. money is like an artificial creation where the government guarantees its value. And so if you want uh, a risk-free store of value, you use money. But you do that at the cost of extracting it from the economy and making it unavailable to use by everybody else as a medium of exchange. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, so to, to go back to what you were, what you were saying uh, about the, um, the role of government, well, at least the position of government as a net borrower. So the government borrows from uh, commercial banks, in effect. Um, and so um, that's something that uh, most people might not be so aware of, as they think that money is created by, uh, by the government uh, printing money. So could you uh, disentangle this relationship for us a bit? I think most people are aware that the government borrows some because the, the expression crops up a lot on the news. Mm. But yes, there's also, I think, a, a lot of cognitive dissonance in some people because it's easy to assume that something which is so obviously a commons, which is money, should be created by a neutral authority. 
rather than sold to us uh, as a service. Like what we have now is money as a service where we pay to rent it into existence. Mm. Um, so right. the government uh, does this borrowing in the form of selling bonds. And there's this elaborate arrangement with the Bank of England and the commercial banks where they sell the bonds, I think, through the Bank of England. Uh, and then the market decides the interest rates. And that means that the government doesn't really have a lot of control over the rates at which it borrows money. But then there are proposals to do it differently. Mm. Yeah, it seems like we, we just, we live in, a, in an economic system, <clears throat> sorry, in which there's a very sort of uh, unhealthy uh, relationship between, between commercial banks and, uh, and, and governments, right? Especially through, uh, when, you, when you consider the influence that um, uh, the banking cartel or, or that, that bankers and the financial system in general exert uh, through the, the political system. So they, uh, they, they influence uh, policy making um, as um, some countries might be worried about their credit worthiness, uh, but they even are governments sometimes, right? We, we know that- It's um, called the revolving door system. Um, right? It applies not only to banking, but to other sectors. Absolutely. So when something becomes very, very specialized, especially, you have to get people in from industry to help the government with the policy making. But then those people usually have shares in those industries and they'll be making the policies uh, in the long term interest of those industries. And so government becomes a servant more of the industries who are the experts. Yeah. And then when whenever a politician uh, leaves, um, leaves a ministry or leaves the government, then they might find a comfortable position. Uh, somewhere in that industry, right? Such as that the, phenomenon has been observed. Hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we've we've just um, we've just taken a, a brief look at uh, uh, what um, this uh, what the structure of this economic and financial system uh, brings about in terms of social inequality, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, influence over uh, the way politics. I run, uh, but also in uh, in I mean in the realm of um, of the um, of uh, the ecology and uh, and how uh, the economy is forced to grow ceaselessly in order for people to just be able to to repay their debts uh, to the I banking think, Darren, system. It's important to mention that those dynamics are completely unrecognised, um, even on the political left, mm -hmm. and mostly by environmentalists. Um, if you talk to a, a reformist politician about what we need to do with um, replacing our energy systems, for example, and all the investment we need to make in uh, ecology, many of them will say, we can't do it now because we need to get back to economic growth before we have any money to invest. Um, so there's this idea that growth is a prerequisite for doing anything with the economy and also that um, we're struggling to get back to growth and therefore we can't do anything. Mm. So this, um, uh, this idea of economic growth is, uh, has, has turned into this, uh, this mantra, uh, which is disconnected from any uh, close observation of what the, um, what the consequences of this growth are. Uh, for instance, in also terms it's of, not clear uh, what growth actually means to normal people. There's this idea mm. that uh, growth, if it's measured by GDP, which it is, um, is really just a measure of the amount of money changing hands in mm. a country. Um, and then there's the assumption that that translates to the well-being of the people, which it absolutely doesn't. It depends which money is changing hands and what real value is being created as the money changes hands. Of course. Uh, that, that's too rich a data, you know, everything is summed up into this one GD figure. And if it's, you know, two, 3%, we're happy. And if it's not, well, we need to change our politicians and do better. Mm. What we do know though, is that if um, the economy doesn't grow, uh, no matter how you, uh, how you measure that exactly, people start losing their jobs. Um, uh, the economy stagnates, so it means that the money circulates even even less, right? This uh, it, it stays in, in, in its pools in uh, wherever it's uh, it's being stored. 
So um, there are structural reasons why the economy needs to grow in order to be healthy. Mm. Uh, and one of them is, uh, we think, uh, economists disagree about this. Um, one of them is that uh, since all money is debt, we need to constantly borrow more money into circulation to pay back the debt, as you said. And the other one uh, is that uh, the money is going into tax havens, so we need to constantly borrow more money to replace the medium of exchange. Mm. So uh, structurally, the economy needs to grow. It's not a choice. It's not because people are greedy. It's not because countries are competing with each other that they need to grow. Mm. If the economy isn't growing, things start to break. And yeah. so the changes that are needed are very, very deep. Mm. So um, let's take a look at uh, the kinds of, uh, of changes that we can envision uh, in this context and um, how um, on, on different levels uh, we can imagine uh, transformations that could be enacted uh, to, this, uh, the, to the, the global monetary and financial system. Um, so if you like, we could start with, um, with the, the top, topmost level, uh, that of uh, government, so uh, national government. Um, so we, we hear a lot, especially uh, in, um, I mean, in uh, American policy making and um, also in the UK, I think, uh, ideas of a Green New Deal. Could you, um, could you tell us a bit uh, how ideas, are, how this kind of idea uh, connect with the creation of money and uh, how it could uh, transform things somewhat. So what happened in the original New Deal um, in the 1930s was that because the economy was so very, very stagnant and there was a great shortage of money, the New Deal uh, allowed the government to borrow uh, a lot more money than it normally would. Uh, and it used that, uh, it did that using Keynesian theory so that if the government would spend money on infrastructure, it would help the economy to grow, taxes would come in and they would be able to pay off the debt. So the, the, the New Deal is a very Keynesian idea. Mm -hmm. um, there are proposals that we should do something similar now because we've had 10 years of recession. Um, and that it should be done not just to kickstart the economy, but to finance the very, very urgent um, ecological reconstruction, rebuilding and redesigning of society that's needed, as we know from deep adaptation and everything else. Um, uh, th but there are lots and lots of problems with the idea of the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you can invest a lot of money in energy infrastructure and then find out that it still doesn't meet your energy needs. I've been reading a lot about that recently. Um, for all the renewable energy you could install, you then need 10 times as much uh, spent on batteries. Mm. Uh, because batteries are super uh, dirty and expensive to produce in those kinds of quantities. Our electricity supply now that's based on uh, coal and nuclear and things like that generates a very high baseline of electricity and we can take the electricity as it's generated. So we have very, very little storage. But uh, with a, a so-called sustainable economic grid, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that because the electricity is generated at different times and different intensities everywhere. Right. So uh, the very idea of investing a huge amount in green electricity, it's not going to replace what we have now. Right. Um, and, and there are many other ways that you could invest money that you wouldn't get it back in taxes. Mm. So you, maybe it's not a Green New Deal at all. You have to accept that we're actually giving the money away or, or spending it on really, really long term projects. Hmm. But do you think that the, uh, those ideas uh, in terms of uh, um, new energy infrastructure and, and so on could be coupled with um, uh, a, a new role for the government uh, in terms of money creation? Do you think that, uh, for instance, ideas of modern monetary theory, which say that a national government that has a monopoly on the use of force and so the, the power to underwrite debts has no, should have no need to rent money from banks or, or citizens? Do, do you think that this could be coupled with 
with uh, so those green the, the green new deal is very poorly defined but mm. yes very often it comes alongside uh, a footnote or a reference to another paper that says we're going to finance this using mmt modern monetary theory and mmt says that uh, the government doesn't have to borrow money from banks the government can just spend the money into existence and then the purpose of taxes is to prevent inflation Mm. Um, so the government is effectively creating money th uh, through spending and destroying money through taxation, which is the opposite way around to how most people, including in the government, think it works these days. So there's this philosophical difference about does the government spend first and tax later or tax first and spend later? It's, mm. it's, a, it's a very profound difference. And so you, um, you see it as workable. Do you think a MMT could actually help? Uh, to transform the economy and uh, and help us evolve towards a different system. Yes, it absolutely could. Um, MMT uh, implies that if something isn't paid for with tax, uh, because a lot of people find tax politically unacceptable, then it can be paid for through inflation, which uh. is like a, a tax on money and especially a tax on people who hold lots of money. Mm. So it could be that... Um, the people who hold lots of money would be against MMT and possibly against a Green New Deal if it couldn't pay for itself through mm. uh, forms of taxation that they found acceptable. Right, yes. Um, okay, um, maybe we could, um, we could move on as it's, uh, it's already 25 past uh, to, uh, to a another level uh, at, uh, at which some transformations could occur. And that's a level that we, uh, that you and I, together with with Jem, um, addressed explicitly in a in a recent paper, we an occasional paper we we published on the the IFLAS website at the University of Cumbria. So that's the idea of uh, local future tax credits. So I don't know if uh, if any of our listeners have had the time to uh, to uh, dig into this uh, rather long. Uh, document, but uh, I, I invite everyone to, uh, to do so if you haven't. Um, so this, uh, uh, this idea we had um, of um, those tax credits um, is one that would address the needs for local governments to, um, in effect, have uh, better means to cope with the current um, climate disruptions and, uh, and the growing uh, ecological crisis that, that we are all facing in a context in which they have uh, fewer and fewer means to, to actually do so. Uh, so we know that worldwide over a thousand local governments have declared a climate emergency, hundreds of them in the, in the United Kingdoms, in the United Kingdom. But um, in a context of, a story of austerity policies that began uh, after the, uh, the 2008 uh, financial crisis, Many of um, the um, many of the um, um, budget uh, allocations received by local governments have been cut uh, by central governments, um, especially because so much money had to be invested into bailing out the big banks that we just mentioned. Uh, and so, as a result, those local governments find themselves uh, less and less able to not only cope with uh, floods and droughts uh, and other natural catastrophes, but also just simply um, social services. Um, we know that healthcare systems have taken a, a, a very severe impact uh, from austerity uh, policies, especially in Europe. Um, and um, so those policies have also affected uh, poverty relief and schooling programs and contributed to widening economic and social uh, inequalities uh, and um, the system is probably not much sounder uh, today than it was in 2008. Uh, things haven't really been transformed at all. So uh, could you explain to us um, briefly how local future tax credit works and, uh, uh, and how they could um, help local governments to cope with this, uh, this context? Well, it's related a bit to what we just said about the government taxing first and spending later. Yeah. Um, and also the idea that the government might sell bonds. 
in this case, instead of selling bonds, what the government would do is accept the taxpayer's money before the tax was due and spend it at that time, the moment it was paid over. And then they would uh, credit the taxpayer's account. Every taxpayer has an account in the local government because sometimes you overpay, sometimes you underpay, sometimes there's some rebates. So you use that account and you just load it up, uh, maybe even several years in advance. So you, you finance the government and then they would give you interest uh, for that. Uh, technically it wouldn't be interest, but uh, it looks like it would be viewed very much as interest. But the difference is that um, the government borrowing from the banks is also borrowing our money, but the banks are in the middle taking a cut. So this way you would cut out the middleman of the banks. So you can lend your money directly to the council, they can borrow at a middle rate, and you can lend it to them at a middle rate. So you've got something like a savings account. Uh, and that's part one of the system. But then the next level we described in the paper is where they could uh, enable a payment system. Mm. So you would be able to pay from your local taxpayer's <laughs> account to another taxpayer, at least in the same area. And that payment would be free and, uh, and it would be from your savings account. So it's even more convenient than a bank where you have to give notice if you want to pay from the savings account. And mm. so the, the local government is therefore in a position, because it's a local government, because local governments find it very hard to default, to um, take a load of money from the taxpayers, spend it, and then deduct it from the taxpayers' accounts later as the tax becomes due. Mm. And so it's a way of using money twice. Uh, the government uses the money by spending it, but then you can use the money at the same time because you can pay from your account to another taxpayer's account in the same area. So and it's very um, similar to what banks are doing. It's not as if banks are actually holding your money and physically moving it from one vault to another. Uh, it's all happening on a ledger. The bankers lent the money out and they just keep a small amount, like about 3% of all the money they say they've got on deposit. They just keep that available in case you want to withdraw it. With the local future tax credits, well, it's, it's tax you've already paid. You probably don't ever need to withdraw it. Mm. Well, that's a detail we could talk about another time. Right. So, uh, right. So, to, to taxpayers, uh, the benefit is that you you actually get um, sort of uh, like the the benefits of a save of a savings account, while in fact having uh, the flexibility of a current account, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, and to the not the full, full flexibility because you would only be able to pay people in that area, uh, taxpayers right. to the same council. You need another level of infrastructure mm. if you want to pay between councils. And that was also described briefly in the paper as well. Right. Yeah. So you could imagine having a, a much wider system connecting local councils nationally or even internationally, right? Or across the, across mm -hmm. Europe or, or elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's quite fascinating. Uh, and it's, uh, it's interesting how it also connects with some historical examples of uh, government uh, being, uh, I mean, functioning in, in the same way. We know that the UK, uh, for many hundreds of years, 600 years, um, collected taxes through tally sticks. Uh, that, yeah. was, uh, that was something that was... Uh, uh, and the tally stick was a piece of wood. Uh, it wasn't money, but it functioned like money because it was a credit note from the government to say that the tax had been paid in advance. Mm. And then the, the, the tally sticks were uh, valid to be used to pay taxes by somebody else. So yeah. you have to get your head around that. Maybe the people here have already got their head around it. But the idea is if I pay my next year's tax and I get a receipt and I can spend that receipt around the economy and then next year somebody else can pay their tax with the receipt because that's the same money that I used to pay next year's tax when I got the receipt. Mm, so yeah. yeah it's a very well established mechanism mm -hmm. um, but also there's other precedents um I, I pointed out in the paper that in britain they created the gyro bank in the 60s and 70s and that was a way of providing a payment system for ordinary people who were at that time unbanked so the, the government provided a, a payment system and it was only later that the bank said oh we can make a profit from this and they started to provide uh, bank accounts that ordinary people could use. So that was an excellent example of the government 
uh, stepping up and providing a service and they led with the technology when they did that, um, pushing all the other banks to innovate. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, they helped the ordinary people and helped the economy by doing things which later on were done by the private sector. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's funny how such ideas get lost in the, or just resurface from um, in the midst of uh, history once in a while. Uh, there was something recently in, in New York, wasn't there? The sort of uh, a sort of similar idea that's been proposed uh, of tax repayments. I think I forget was the it? initials, but I was fascinated because yeah. it was like three days before we published the paper. The news came out that uh, it's a, a proposed project in New York, and it's not about tax prepayments. Um, but uh, New York will use uh, tax deductions to reward people, um, especially for volunteering. So everybody's got their tax mm -hmm. account and the government would put something in that tax account, which would be then used, uh, deducted from their, the taxes that became due. Mm -hmm. And the project uh, proposal is to use that account as a payment system so that New Yorkers can pay each other using their tax credits, but not prepaid, sure. but uh, more like rebate tax credits. Do you know how they call them? Do, do they actually call them tax credits or how was um, the... I don't know what they're called. Have we got any New Yorkers around? Uh, we can probably search that later. But, wow, that's a... Uh, it's, it's inspiring. It's something that's, that's around. And there was something in Italy also recently with the, the mini bots, although it's a, it's a bit different. Uh, even there was something in California in 2009 uh, right, with registered in California the, they were paying their uh, the government staff with uh, promises that they would get their salary later because mm. they had uh, they'd run out of cash mm. the government never actually runs out of money because they're collecting taxes all the time so if the government promises you money it's supposed to be good mm. right so um, yeah, anyway, so we, we see that with, uh, with such mechanisms, local governments can find breathing space to, um, to provide services to their constituencies and, uh, and to um, uh, basically cope better with, uh, with the, the increasing pressure they are facing both financially, but also socially and, and ecologically. Um, but now maybe we can say a few words to what um, what we uh, ordinary folks who, who might not be in uh, local governments or in even uh, even less in uh, national gov governments, what, what can we do uh, in order to transform money around uh, ourselves? I'm sure you, you have uh, you have some interesting um, um, pointers to give us on uh, how to what new forms of money could we uh, could we use better in our in our daily lives. So this is what I've been focused on myself for the whole of the last 10 years with writing the software and making the MOOC and things like that. I'm aware that time is very short, so I'll just say so very briefly. Um, what, um, instead of appealing to national government or local government to change things, there are ways that we can work in our own lives and our own businesses to behave differently economically. And um, there are many, many different designs of local currencies, but the one that I find the most compelling and the most powerful is called mutual credit. And this can be done between businesses and it's, uh, there's a whole industry doing that, the business barter industry. And if a lot more of that was being done, we might find that uh, the recession wasn't hurting nearly so badly because in a mutual credit system, a, a community who trust each other a bit effectively create, create their own trading liquidity. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're able to exchange amongst each other because they've created the medium of exchange with which to do so. And so mm -hmm. what I've been working to support all this time, and I'm now doing still in London with the Open Credit Network, is the creation of small groups of local and ethical businesses who extend a bit of trust to one another and then they can exchange with each other without money. Mm. And the proposal that we put out alongside with the local future tax credits 
was my design for joining all of those systems together. Because mm. those systems, uh, they have uh, scaling constraints because they depend on how much the members can trust each other. But in my proposal of the Credit Commons, it's not rocket science, you just nest those systems. And so uh, instead of having thousands of people trying to trust each other, you can have groups trusting each other and making trust relationships. And it's just for short term credit, hopefully. Mm. Uh, then they, 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 they do need some governance structure over the top, but all of that makes it interesting. And uh, the, all economic mechanisms need governance structures. Mm. So we put forward the credit commons and the local future tax credits together side by side um, as a way of stimulating discussion about uh, possible economic reforms. Mm. I would encourage everybody to try and join or start up a business barter network uh, and if not even that, then to try to conduct your professional relationships in ways that use less money, in ways yeah. that value what your customers do. So if my customer is, um, I don't know, making shit chickens uh, or selling shoes, then I would go to them for my shoes or my chickens uh, rather than to the nearest market. And that way, um, I wouldn't have to pay them and they wouldn't have to pay me. Uh, this leads to a very different kind of economy. When we mediate our transactions through money, it says this is a professional relationship. There's all kinds of contracts involved where it's mediated by the government and by the banks. Um, and it changes the feel of it. And I believe it even affects our happiness very often. So it's not just for technical reasons of liquidity, that we need to be thinking about uh, demonetizing our professional lives and our livelihoods. It's also for reasons of happiness uh, and also for reasons of resilience. Because if we're using the national money, we're vulnerable to shocks and crises in the national money system. Of course, we have a very long way to go before we can completely remove ourselves from the national money system. Mm. Uh, so this is only a start. So in a way, you, you recommend that we go back to, um, to the trust, which is at the, at the root of, uh, um, of uh, money itself, right? I mean, conceptually, it's, uh, it's all about trust and trusting others, trusting that money is worth something. So what, what we don't just focus on the trust itself and, uh, and not necessarily through money, right? Yeah, if you, have a, if you have a huge national and global economy, you do need huge national and global institutions um, to help to mediate the exchange. But if we trade on a local basis, all of that is unnecessary infrastructure and it's, it's costly. Mm. Brilliant. Thanks, Matthew. So, um, okay, um, we, uh, we've gone on for a little later, a little longer than, than we were expecting, but we shall now open up the floor to uh, questions. So uh, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hands and uh, we will unmute you to hear your question. You can also do so um, through um, this managed participants uh, window and you, you have a, a little raise my hand icon, but yeah, which, uh, whichever way works for you. So who wants to, to go first? Oh, Brian, uh, let me unmute you. The unmute, oh yeah, there you go. Hi, there Brian. We go. I think I'm on. Hi. So thanks for this, guys. I, I uh, came a little late, so maybe you've already addressed the question that pops up in my head. There's actually two, and they're completely different. I'll, I'll pose them both just briefly. Um, the first is the medium of exchange. So I, I love the idea of um, creating and participating in a local economy, basically, you know, like a barter type of system. But, you know, when I think about my local farmer and wanting to get some chickens and eggs uh, and vegetables from my local farmer in exchange for, you know, some service or something that I can provide I, I wonder what's your thinking on the medium of exchange? I mean, is, 
is you know dollars or pounds actual bank notes appropriate in that in that context i mean you're still sort of relying on the central printing of that currency and so forth but it seems like it's universally recognized or do you sort of advocate for more of a a brand new kind of local currency and if that's the case then you know how do you overcome the barriers of of creating that and 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 uh you know generating trust in it and everything else and then a separate question kind of unrelated i wonder what you think about um local investment so like if you've got people who have investment dollars in sort of traditional investment vehicles in the us that's 401ks and it's brokerage accounts and that kind of stuff i like the idea of trying to bring that money home and and using it in a way that is more locally focused and i wonder if you have any thoughts about ways to do that you know finding local bonds or or, or something you know your city is trying to improve its its water infrastructure to deal with with heavier rainfall you know and they need money to do that and they they put out a bond issuance um and i suppose you can buy those but i i'm just curious if you have thoughts about you know ways to to sort of take investment money and bring it home rather than just putting it out into the sort of ether of uh brokerage accounts and and you know etfs and all this kind of uh financial instruments that that you know most investors are are familiar with so thanks thanks brian Okay, Matthew? I think uh, the longer the question, the shorter the answer. So uh, if we want to do local trades with local people, uh, sure, you can use dollars and all of those available instruments. Um, and sometimes it's really the best thing. Sometimes dollars is, is what the, the person you're buying from most needs uh, because we've all got bills to pay in the wider economy. But the point is to try to use something else or anything else um, preferably what you produce. But you can also circulate beer. Uh, it's been done, you know, people produce beer and they pay with beer and then the beer can so circulate in the local economy as a, a form of payment. Uh, or you can just have a, an IOU in your head. Or you can do it as a gift. Um, sometimes gifts come back to you, sometimes they go around. So um, a mutual credit system is a, a slightly more formal way of doing things and to to create one of those you have to get everybody together and decide on a unit of account and just decide on some balance limits so how much can everybody uh, have credit off everybody else but um, you don't have to do that to start uh, you might find that if lots of people are um, experimenting with money and means of payment and trust around you then you might want to get together and create something more formal to make it a bit more powerful and effective. So moving on to the second question about local investment, that's less my area. I understand that uh, issuing bonds is very difficult legally, uh, and very costly. And although in UK local councils are allowed to do it, they don't because it's just too much trouble. And that might be one of the problems with local future tax credits is very similar to issuing bonds. And uh, we didn't do the research as to exactly how much trouble that is. And so if it's a lot of trouble for local councils to issue bonds, how much harder is it going to be for ordinary people who want to get together and finance themselves a windmill? So those vehicles don't really exist. There's a thing in Britain called the community shares unit. Uh, I think the government set it up to help people buy back pubs and there's a, there's a trust, I mentioned it in the paper or in the blog that goes with the paper that helps people with uh, advice uh, to do community finance things. But it seems to be very difficult legally. Uh, one way to get around a lot of that is to trust each other more. What costs money and what is difficult is bringing in the government and the legal system for when one of your members changes their mind or defaults or fails or dies. And if you can uh, take that kind of hit because you trust each other enough, then those kinds of actions should be much, much easier. 
you can do things entirely informally. I mean, just imagine uh, insurance. So you, you've got uh, maybe 20 people who decide to insure each other's houses. How formal does that really have to be? Um, you don't even have to put money into a pot because the insurance could be when somebody's house burns down, everybody else just finds five or 10,000 pounds or dollars to help them build a new house. So everybody has to sort of make sure they keep that money available, but it doesn't have to be in a pot with a third party earning interest. And I'd like to see much more innovation around that. That's the best answer I can give to your question, especially while leaving time for others. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I see we have um, a question in the chat from uh, in the chat box from uh, from Sasha from a few minutes ago. Um, Sasha, would you like to um, to actually speak out your your question to us? Uh, I can unmute you. Please go ahead. Um, I didn't actually mean it as a question; it was more a comment. Oh. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry. Um, I did find it very. Um, inspiring what I read in Braiding Sweetgrass, and I did make some changes in my life about the difference between money economy and uh, gift economy, of, that it creates a different sense of trust and bonding in a community. And I made some different actions in my own life that have been effective. Um, and uh, were, you, uh, were you saying that um, it seems like uh, the, the let's schemes that you were involved with uh, have become less active uh, in recent years? Um, that was me who said that about the LED schemes, actually. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, Betty. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that was, uh, yes. Um, but would you like to follow up on this? Yeah, well, it was just an observation that um, I used to be involved in these LED schemes, and that was before the internet or social media. Um, and it was all done on paper. It was incredibly laborious. We had to kind of reprint um, new directories every three months or something like that. And everything was done by paper. Um, and then just around the time when the technology became available to run it much more easily online, all these schemes seems to have seem to have fallen by the way wayside. It's really weird. I don't know. I have no explanation. It's just an observation, really, and maybe a question why that might be. I don't know whether Matthew has got a theory on that. I have many theories on it. Um, I was uh, in about uh, two thousand and three, four. I started working on the software specifically for Let's in UK, and then two thousand and eight, I went full time. So I can tell you they haven't all fallen by the wayside. Um, although in England, um, they're not very strong. In France, there's still about 500 going along, uh, and several hundred, I believe, in Germany, and uh, time banks are all over the place. Um, my concern with those things is that they, uh, many of them want to make the transition to the formal economy, but they just don't. And that business barter systems, um, are uh, very different animals. So people have tried to innovate within Let's in many ways by bringing in um, high street shops and trying to make formal systems of volunteering, but it just doesn't seem to work. And also the um, Let's tend to get limited in their size. And I don't know the reason for that. I imagine that uh, once I had come along and provided software that made all the administration much easier, the Let's systems might be able to grow but they didn't. And now I think there's a problem that um, they're not replacing themselves with young people. So um, many people involved in Let's now are, are, are well over 50 and they don't have that um, uh, drive or inspiration to follow through with new technologies. And they're very happy to think of the Let's as a, a small social circle, which it very mm -hmm. often is. So I I'm looking forward to something new coming up, um, some new brand or some new framing of mutual credit. Yeah. And in part, that's what I'm working on in London with the Open Credit Network. Yeah. I mean, there are some examples of local currencies, like in Stroud, for instance, which are sort of like a continuation of the LET scheme. 
I don't see them as a continuation of the lets because they're not doing mutual credit. In those systems, you have, uh, they put the pound in the bank and they give you a piece of paper. So they're not creating any new liquidity. Mm. So uh, what's, what's the numbers that you find that the let schemes tend to stagnate? Um, I haven't been looking recently, but um, about 150 paying members. And then the, the inner circle would often be 20 people. Yeah, but isn't there a theory but, that um, Nigel's an expert on lets. Isn't there a theory that human beings can only maintain meaningful connections with around 150 people? So that would kind of match that number quite neatly. It is a theory, but um, I don't know if it really applies here. I, I think there's probably several other things going on. Mm. That's just my opinion. Thanks, Patty. Um, okay, we, we had, um, I think Tony had his, uh, his hand raised for, for some time and then Sasha and maybe Nigel if we if we have time. Uh, right, uh, this question ties into what Betty and Matthew have been talking about which is uh, Bancor is, is an interface software program to allow value exchanges be, among networks of different value exchanges as I understand and I'd be interested in Matthew's uh, thinking how to apply that kind of a uh, application or process to mutual credit. Could you speak to that, Matt? Yeah, I've looked at Banco very closely and uh, wrote a couple of blogs on it last year. If I can be very brief about it, um, we might be more accurate to say that Bancor is a system for token exchange rather than value exchange because there's nothing to say that the tokens have any value or who values them or what they're valuable in terms of. Um, it does so in a context of the free market where there's, the tokens themselves don't have any value or any agreed value. They only have a market price in terms of supply and demand. And so that, uh, one of the common features of money is that it should have a declared or agreed value. It's not just a commodity that sits on a market. And that's a problem with all the, the money in the world today. It's regarded as a market commodity. And so Bancor is in that paradigm. So that's not to say you couldn't set up Bancor to trade with money where you define the value because it's very configurable. But then I would say that Bancor is working in a trustless paradigm. Um, it's, it's a blockchain, it's immensely complicated and difficult. And so it's over-engineered um, for uh, any kind of trust relationships. And um, also the fact that it's working with tokens and not with credit means that you kind of have to reverse engineer Bancor to get it to do the kinds of things which I'm designing the Credit Commons to do. Thank you. Um, Sasha, I think you've had your, your hand raised. Yes, I think the idea of increasing trust as a way to make changes in the economy is really interesting and something that would be interesting to go into more. I've lived in a rural community and done quite a bit of barter and other things here and um, there are definitely some things that can come up when you try to change from money exchange into a more trusting system. And I just think it would, would be great just to take that on as a topic of conversation. Yeah, I agree. That's a very valuable topic. Um, I've been living somewhat in the gift for much of the last 10 years as a nomad. Um, but I found that very easy. Um, maybe because I was moving from community to community and didn't have to uh, endure people or them endure me for very long. Uh, there was a recent blog post on, uh, on the Deep Adaptation blog, Gem's blog, about living in community together. And in Deep Adaptation generally, it's all about uh, how do we live together and relate in a deeper way, uh, which is all part of living in community. One day I'll become an expert in it. Um, so we have uh, a question from Nigel, I believe, and then maybe uh, one from Francesca in the chat box, if possible. Uh, was that a, a no, Nigel? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you're uh, unmuted. Okay, 
Yeah. yeah. I, I think it was Betty that was talking about Stroud. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not good on that. Anyway, I know Sandra Bruce very well. She ran the Stroud Registration. I'll give, her the, give Betty some numbers. There were 500 people-ish who were users. I, I call them users, not, and system not scheme, but that's me. There were about 500 people, but it was driven by about 25 single mothers that worked together because they had low income. And like when it was birthday time, the kids wanted a present or they wanted a party or something like that. So the core of the thing was the social relations between these single mothers. Hanging off that core was loads of self-employed people like guys who um, trim trees, you know, they saw a branch that was in the way off, repair your car, things like that. <coughs> they spent, they probably earned oof, maybe five or ten percent of their monthly income through the let system but the mothers themselves were the drivers that the 500 people hung off and it was kind of like mm, decreasing intensity since the circle got bigger however you could hire a cottage in the south of france a hundred percent lets stroud lets you'd have to pay the train fare to get there in, in euros or pounds or something, but the cottage itself you could hire in let. Sandra is now in Ireland, I'm still in contact with her. She's been bu busy starting Steiner schools and this, that and the other, and is no longer interested in all the garbage around professional poverty developers. Um, she's much more interested in reality creating rather than money creating. Uh, which frustrates me because I'd like her to be involved. But there are people all over the world playing with Bitcoin y kind of things as community currencies. And I was just contacted by somebody who was being paid by the Indonesian government to create a local currency in Indonesia, being paid a very fat um, consultant fee and raised $3 million this year alone for investment in local currency. So it's not dead, but one thing that really upsets me as a kind of in my body is this word trust. I don't trust anybody. People have a reputation or they don't. If somebody has a reputation kicking my door in, then I don't let him anywhere near it. If somebody has a reputation of knocking nicely and say, hey, I've got some hot dinner, would you like to eat something? then they tend to be more welcome. So I would really, really, really like the discussion to shift from trust to reputation, at which point I'll pick that up and let you talk amongst yourself. Thanks. Thanks, Nigel. Maybe we can um, continue this conversation on the, on the thread around this event, if you like, on the, on the forum. I would be happy to, if you like. we're working yep. hard internationally. Mm, thanks a lot. Maybe um, the difference between trust and reputation is that uh, I've been speaking about trust as something that happens one to one, whereas reputation is about what everybody thinks of somebody. And you can really trade much more with your reputation. Uh, if you look at the economy as a network effect, then yes, uh, reputation is what counts rather than individual opinions. I'd like to come back to you just very, very quickly. I was in Sri Lanka staying in a small village, well, a large village, a very small town. And the guys had very heavy wooden boats. So when they came back from fishing, every, well, I needed about 20 people to pull the boat up, up the um, beach. They knew who put their back into it when it came to pulling boats, yeah? They could feel it. You know, like if somebody with one leg was doing their best, they would help them pull their boat. If, on the other hand, you were pretending to pull the boat up, everybody suddenly found they were otherwise occupied when it came to your boat to pull up the beach. So you had a reputation within the community just for pulling boats up the beach, but then it went on to all the rest of the stuff that people did together. And they were a community because they needed each other. You know, if you were going to town, you needed to live with the neighbours or something like that. They lived in community already. And the weird thing about where I live in Brussels is nobody talks to anybody else under any circumstances whatsoever. It's really mm. bizarre. <laughs> yeah. 
lessons to be um, to be gained here for deep adaptation on the on the local level. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Nigel. Uh, let's see. Uh, do we have Matthew? Do you want to take uh, one one last quick question? There was one in the chat box from uh, Francesca asking you to expand on the on the the London Open Network. I think she was referring to the. Um, um, the open credit network. Uh, do you think, or is that? Um, yeah, so to conclude, uh, thanks everyone for your contributions, because when I'm on screen, I tend to forget everything that I'm supposed to be saying. So you added uh, depth. Uh, the, uh, the open credit network is a project inspired by the Credit Commons white paper that I wrote three years ago. And they want to build uh, cooperative business barter networks and net network them all together uh, with the possibility of creating something uh, really profoundly different economically, something with the potential to scale and um, move the monetary power back to producers and away from the banks. So if people are interested in that, you can, uh, you can sign your business up or they may be uh, they may have voluntary positions. And uh, so Nenad pasted the link to uh, the Open Credit Network in the chat box in case Thanks, uh, yes, you guys want to check it out. And I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to end on, um, on this reference because it's actually through uh, the work of the people of lowimpact.org, this great website, which I recommend to everyone, and who are the founders of uh, the Open Credit Network. That I got to uh, to know you, Matthew, and then to know Jem through you, and then to get involved in all of this. So it's um, yeah, very uh, very nice um, to see that they are continuing on this uh, trajectory. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for for joining us today. And um, it was uh, it was great to uh, to hear from you. Uh, if you um, if you want to uh, to read the LFTC paper that we refer to. Um, I pasted a link in the chat box, uh, but you also see it referenced on the, the professions network. There's a thread in the forum. Uh, also, please feel free to uh, continue this conversation uh, on the event page. Um, and um, we look forward to um, connecting with you again, um, be it in person or online. So. Thank you so much. And thank you, Matthew, for, for your brilliant explanations. Take care, everyone. And uh, have a great thank weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.